I want to begin for just a few minutes uh, reflecting on what happened in Las Vegas. 58 people killed. How many hundreds wounded? 515 seems to be the common count by either gunfire or their running for safety. It is the largest mass shooting in American history. There is no sense to this, none whatsoever. It is not part of God's plan, so we need to immediately forget any idea that God somehow allowed this to happen to make some kind of a point. A lone gunman shot and killed people from 32 floors above a venue where everyone from little kids to adults gathered just wanting to have a little bit of fun at a concert that night. About 80 years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, wrote this wonderful small little book called Christianity and Social Order, in which he posed the question, what right has the church to interfere when it comes to public policy. Admittedly, Congress and the President are given the ministry to create laws and regulations. So no, it is not up to us, members of the church, to prescribe the exact legislation that they should craft, pass, and sign any more than it is up to the United States Congress to revise the Book of Common Prayer. We do have a right to say, what is it going to take? Most of us thought that the murder of 20 little kids and their six teachers and staff would have been enough for the two sides to have actually sat down and talked with one another. But it wasn't. So the question becomes, is this going to be enough? And that is a question that we rightly can ask Mr. Trump, and Mr. Tester, and Mr. Danes, and Mr. Gianforte, and the rest. That is a role that we actually have. We have a right to be prophetic and to cry out that this kind of thing is absolutely intolerable. FDR said that those in authority should do something. And if it works, they should do more of it. And if it doesn't work, then they should do something else. But they ought to do something, something, anything, by talking with one another. How hard is that? Secondly, I think we can say as a church that in our experience, things do change in our lives. The Episcopal Church as we know it today and the Bill of Rights were created in the exact same year, 1789, I believe in the exact same month, September. Today, the Episcopal Church has been forced, and sometimes willingly has done so, but has been drawn to change to a changing world. Well, so obviously women are deacons and priests and bishops in our church today. That wasn't the case in 1789 by any stretch of the imagination. But also in 1789, the best one could do in shooting a gun was to load it, fire it, and then reload and fire it in the time of one minute. Those really talented people could do so perhaps in three times in a minute. Such a case is just no longer the, sh the same. Now it's scriptural to remember that Jesus did change his mind now and again. And he looked at the situation in front of him differently and he said circumstances are such that I need to rethink this. And he did it at least twice. So did God. In fact, in Genesis, God repented of God's actions. And the rainbow is the sign of that. Craig and I saw that as we were approaching Highway 200, cutting across up from Helena yesterday. This beautiful rainbow uh, just spanning the, the horizon. It wasn't there for our entertainment or enjoyment. The rainbow was put up there to remind God by God, never to destroy the world again. God changed God's mind. And the third thing is this, and maybe this is the most important. In this room, if you look around, we represent Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives, 
We represent those who advocate gun control, gun safety, and gun rights. Does anybody here ever believe that we do not have the ability to talk to one another? Does anybody here actually believe that when we talk with one another, we could not reach some kind of consensus on something? We know we can. And we know we can because we know that however we may think differently, and we all do think quite differently probably on this, we are one body. We are one church. We are one people. And quite frankly, every single Sunday and every day in between, we act that way as one. And that's our greatest witness that we have to the nation, I think. That we can be very varied on the way that we think. But we are one. And we talk to one another and we love one another. And finally, I think it's important that we remember that we always rest in the fact that the ministry of God through Christ is raising the dead to new life. That's the business of Jesus in the world. Through him that's been done for all of those who were struck down that Monday night. But now it's up to every single one of us to do the exact same. However we can, we've been called to bring new life into a nation that at this moment is depressed and it's wounded and it is stuck and it is demoralized. Maybe in ways we haven't been for an awfully long time. And therefore we the body of Christ cannot afford to be overwhelmed by loss and remain stuck ourselves. It is in our calling and it's in our DNA to draw life out of death wherever we see it. And so we have no choice but to hold hands and refuse to be divided and to go forward. We have no choice because we have to be the hope for those who at this moment have none. That's a sobering thing to know about yourself, but it's also a privilege that God has given us. Well, this morning, as I mentioned, we're doing things a little bit differently. We're celebrating the sesquicentennial anniversary of the Missionary District of Montana, which included the territories of Utah and Idaho as well. Over 310,000 square miles of territory. And I often think in my mind's eye of the Bishop of Rhode Island saying, do you know how hard my job probably is? No, this was big. We were actually created in 18, 66 at a meeting at the House of Bishops in Denver and Daniel Sylvester Tuttle was elected to serve as the first bishop of this diocese but with his being a mere 29 years old he had to wait until he was 30 to be ordained and that occurred in 1867. And that partly is the reason why we kind of use this year as that which is foundational for us. And then within the next seven months of 67 there was his long trip from Albany, New York, all the way out to Salt Lake City. Did most of that by train, part of it by stage. And then it was hopping on a stage and coming all the way up here. Entering into Montana, crossing the divide on the afternoon of July 18th. And to welcome him that evening, it snowed three inches. <laughs> And so we have all these dates from 150 years ago that can serve as various marks of commemoration. So you may say, well, why did you pick today? Well, one, Craig's available. That's the first thing. <laughs> well, that's not it in totality. Today is also a, an anniversary of note that could be added to the list. It was on October 8th of 1867 that Bishop Tuttle wrote in his journal the following. I wrote an appeal to the East for funds to help build a schoolhouse for the Salt Lake Mission. Such an entry would not be all that earth-shaking, of course, to most of us, but our own Ronnie Budge. It is significant because the school that Bishop Tuttle imagined that day and for which he wrote for funds was the one that she would attend in ninth grade. 
Happy anniversary, Ronnie. <laughs> so following the service today, and a light breakfast for everyone, my brother Craig is going to give the presentation that he gave yesterday at the diocesan convention that celebrates looking at the early days of our history, helping us make this a very festive day indeed. Now in the fine tradition of football, a couple weeks ago I called an audible at the line and changed the play by grabbing from the prayer book the readings to commemorate the anniversary of the dedication of a church rather than use the ones that were scheduled for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And I must say that after I made that decision, I read them. And it was a little funny to find in the reading prescribed from Matthew's Gospel the story in which Jesus came roaring into the temple and started turning over tables and chairs of the money changers. Now, why would the whole business of tossing out the cashiers be part of a celebration of the anniversary of a church? After all, if you really get behind the image of what happened in the temple, what you find is that Jesus basically expelled what we would know today as the altar guild. <laughs> Think about it. These guys actually made the services possible by selling pigeons, by exchanging money. Back then, for certain rites, you needed some creature to sacrifice, and rather than bringing a pigeon all the way over from Nazareth, it just made sense to buy it at the temple at Jerusalem. These folks at the receiving end of Jesus' anger provided that particular service. The second thing that was necessary was paying the temple tax using money that was acceptable to the temple itself. And so if you brought from home that which was the coinage of the empire, and it just had to be exchanged. It made it a whole lot easier. It's sort of like if one of our guests from north of the border coming here for services and wanting to put a couple of loonies into the plate came up with an idea. Knowing that such a contribution would really confound Sean when making the deposit, he or she might strike a deal with a neighbor in the pew and turn five Canadian into four U.S. dollars. What could possibly be wrong with something like that? Well, there were a number of things that were very unsettling about it all to Jesus. To begin, a house of prayer resembling the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and noise and commotion does not lend itself in any way to a sense of reverent spirituality and sanctified grace. And the second thing, far more important, was that the practice compelled an individual to make a sacrifice in order to be in a right relationship with his Lord or her Lord. Remember, this ritual had as a part of its understanding that one would buy the bird, have it sacrificed, and as a result anticipate now being reconciled with God. But in the mind of Christ, you didn't buy the love of God, or you didn't get it through some sense of sacrifice any more than a child today buys the love of a parent. It's simply given you. God's love for all of us is inherent in the very nature of God, and all we are ever asked to do is just simply relish it, simply celebrate it, and then mirror it for everybody around us. It's pretty easy. The implication in all of this is that those who could not or those who chose not to sacrifice could very much enjoy the same relationship with God as did those who followed the prescribed practice. So to put it mildly, Jesus did not just overturn the tables and the chairs of the money changers and the purveyors of the pigeons. He turned it on its heel, the whole business of making a right relationship with God. That now could be seen as simply a gift that went to the totality of creation. So this is huge. It is huge. And here comes the best part. After clearing out those who were probably running for the hills, thinking that our Lord was as dangerously crazy as a rabbit badger, the blind and the lame just started to come pouring into the place. And they also came with children. 
And what's interesting in this is that the suffering and the disabled were not known to be allowed into the innermost parts of the structure. And therefore, this also, in a sense, is a radical departure from business as usual. And then you add to that those who, all those kids who started screaming out, Hosanna to the son of David. And to that and the healing of the inflicted and the inclusion of the no count was just enough for all of the scribes and the chief priests. They could not stand that. And the whole existence of the temple and of its practice of sacrifice as a laudable institution really took a considerable hit that day and nothing could ever be quite the same. As some of you know, my former boss and friend and mentor, Bill Maxwell, has really turned into quite the poet in his ninth and tenth decades of life. And I noticed something in one of his poems, the epiphany story concerning the magi or the wise men who came to visit Jesus bearing gifts that really seemed apropos for this particular day in this season of Pentecost. Because all these visitors came from outside Jerusalem, or Israel for that matter, Bill wrote the following. He said, the definition of God's people was suddenly enlarged. The people of God turned into an extended family that included unlikely folk, us, us. When we look at the reading we had this morning from Matthew and then we think of Bishop Tuttle and company, the Reverends Foote and Goddard, making their way west a century and a half ago, and all of the others who paved the way for them, it does kind of feel like with the advent of the church, the Episcopal Church in Montana, that the appreciation of what made up God's people was suddenly enlarged into an extended family that included even the most unlikely. Prospectors for gold and silver, the saloon keepers, the dancing girls, gamblers, and those who got in fights after drinking a wee dram too much the night before. And as I mentioned two weeks ago, along kind of a more tame strand, the church in Virginia City had a Unitarian on the vestry and a Baptist leading morning prayer. How about that? What was organized in Montana was indeed made up of an inclusion of an unlikely gathering of folks, us. And so today we rejoice in our family tree, strange as it may be, for here we find ourselves and we find one another sharing bread and wine at a common altar radio, participating with the rest of us in the prayers and the readings and the hymns, and quite simply just proclaiming community by sharing a pew, a community that cannot be broken. We are kin. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Even so, as was the case 150 years ago, there still remain others out there who do not know in the heart the sacred existence of such a family as ours, and yet they just ache for it. They want it so badly. We have what they earnestly desire, and we have had it for an awfully long time. And so it behooves us, I think, to share the gospel. With roots like ours here, one and all can find home. And that will always stand as very good news, especially for those who just might be seeking shelter from the storm. Amen. <laughs>